Okay, hello Cloud Gurus and welcome to the EC2 summary. So congratulations, you're at the end of another section of the course. Hopefully you've learnt an awful lot. The first thing we learnt about was what EC2 is. It's basically just a resizable compute capacity in the cloud or it's a way of provisioning virtual machines in the cloud. And it reduces the time required to obtain and boot new servers um, instances to minutes rather than hours or days or weeks or months depending on where you work. And it allows you to quickly scale capacity both up and down as your computing requirements change. So we have four different uh, pricing models for EC2. We've got on demand, and this is where you pay a fixed rate by the hour or by the second with no long-term commitments. We then have reserved. This is where you have a capacity reservation. Contract terms are one years uh, or three years. The more you pay up front and the longer the contract term, the more discounts you get. We then have spot. This enables you to bid whatever price you want for instance capacity uh, and basically moves around like the stock market. And we then have dedicated hosts and this is physical EC2 servers that are dedicated for you. And this can be uh, useful where you've got uh, existing server bound software licenses or perhaps regulations saying that you cannot use multi-tenant virtualization. Do remember going into your exam that if a spot instance is terminated by EC2 um, because the price has changed, you're not going to be charged for that partial hour of usage. However, if you terminate the instance yourself, you are going to be charged for any hour in which the instance ran. We then looked at our different EC2 instance types and we came up with the mnemonic Fight Dr. McPixie AU. So in Austin or in Australia, depending on what you want. Uh, so there's Dr. McPixie. She's clearly a pixie because she's got wings. She's uh, clearly Scottish because she's wearing tartan. Uh, she wants to fight. You can see there's a stethoscope around her. So fight Dr. McPixie. And like I said earlier, you don't really need to understand every single EC2 instance type going into this exam. Where it does become uh, more useful is when you if you go on to do the uh, professional level exams, they will test you as to whether or not it's a valid instance type or not. Moving on to EBS, we learned that EBS is basically a virtual hard disk drive in the cloud. Just remember that termination protection is turned off by default, so you must turn it on. So if you do wanna go ahead and protect your EC2 instances from being uh, accidentally deleted by your developers or system administrators, make sure that termination protection uh, is turned on. On an EBS-backed instance, the default action is for the root EBS volume to be deleted when the instance is terminated. So if you do go in and terminate your EC2 instances, you are going to delete that root device volume automatically. But if you add um, a additional attach volumes to that EC2 instance, They those additionally attach volumes won't be deleted automatically uh, unless you go in and check that checkbox. Also remember that EBS root volumes of your default AMIs can be encrypted. You can also use third party tools such as BitLocker for Windows, for example, to encrypt the, encrypt the root device volume. Uh, it can also be done when creating AMIs. So we will cover that off in a few more slides. Just remember the lab that we did in, on it. Uh, and you can also, um, um, do it through the AWS console or using the API. And also remember that additional volumes can also be encrypted. Moving on to security groups, all inbound traffic is always blocked by default. All outbound traffic is allowed. Changes to security groups take effect immediately. So as soon as you open up port 80, that uh, effect uh, takes effect immediately. And then you can also have any number of EC2 instances within a security group. And you can have multiple security groups attached to to EC2 instances. And we did that when we went into the EFS lab. We attached a, our default security group as well as our web DMZ security group as well. Moving on to, again, staying on security groups. So security groups are stateful. That means that when you open up a, a, a port, um, so if you open up port 80, it's going to be open for um, both inbound and outbound traffic. Network ACLs are stateless. When you go and do a network ACL, you're gonna have to open up uh, port 80, uh, both inbound and then also outbound. So we're gonna cover that off in the VPC section of the course. If you create an inbound rule allowing traffic in, that traffic is automatically allowed back out again and you cannot block specific IP addresses using security groups instead you're going to be using network access control lists and again we will see that in the VPC section of the course and you can always specify allow rules with security group but not deny rules 
Then we looked at EBS. These are the different EBS types. So we've got general purpose SSD or GP2. We've got provisioned IOPS SSD, which is IO1. So those are our two different flavors of SSD. And essentially, if you want your IOPS to go above 16,000, you want to move from general purpose over to provisioned IOPS. We then have hard disk drives. So we've got three different types. We've got throughput optimized hard disk drives or ST1. We've got cold hard disk drives or SC1. And then we've got EBS magnetic Magnetic, and this is sometimes referred to just as standard as its API name. Uh, and that um, typically is previous generation, so you might not see that in the exam. With the throughput optimize and cold hard disk drive, basically if you, you need to optimize throughput, choose throughput optimize. If you just want the lowest cost storage available, use cold hard disk drive. So staying on EBS, volumes exist on EBS, so just think of as EV EBS as a virtual hard disk drive in the cloud. Snap Snapshots exist on S3, and I want you to think of snapshots as a photograph of the disk. And snapshots are actually point in time copies of the volumes, and snapshots are incremental. So this means that only the blocks that have changed since your last snapshot are moved to S3. And if you take a snapshot for the first time, it may take some time to create. That's because it's um, doing its very first one, but then it will only um, replicate. If you take a second snapshot, it's only going to replicate the deltas. So it's only going to replicate the changes. To create a snapshot for Amazon's EBS volumes that serve as root device volumes, you should always try and stop the instance before taking the snapshot, and that will give you a, a, a consistent snapshot. But that is optional. You can take snapshots on running instances as well. Uh, and you can create AMIs from both volumes and snapshots. And you can actually change EBS volume sizes on the fly, including changing the size and the storage type. And volumes will always be in the same availability zone as the EC2 instance. You can't, cannot have an EC2 instance in one availability zone and then an EBS volume in another bear that in mind as well. In terms of migrating EBS, so to move an EC2 volume from one availability zone to another, you just take a snapshot of it, you then create an AMI from the snapshot, and then you use the AMI to launch um, that EC2 instance in a new availability zone. And likewise, if you want to move EC2 volumes from one region to another, take a snapshot of it, create an AMI from the snapshot, and then copy the AMI from one region to another. And then you use the copied AMI to launch the new EC2 to instance in the new region. Encryption, snapshots of encrypted volumes are encrypted automatically. Volumes restored from encrypted snapshots are encrypted automatically as well. And you can share snapshots, but only if they are unencrypted. And you can share snapshots with other AWS accounts, or you can actually make them public as well. Moving on to unencrypted root device volumes. So root device volumes can now be encrypted when you provision your EC2 instance. You don't need to uh, worry about it. Um, but if you do have an unencrypted root device volume that needs to be encrypted, you need to do the following. So you go ahead and create a snap of the unencrypted root device volume. You then create a copy of the snapshot and then select the encrypt option. And then you create an AMI from the encrypted snapshot. And then you use that AMI to launch the encrypted instances. So just like we did in the lab earlier on. EBS versus instance store. So instance store volumes are sometimes referred to as ephemeral storage. Instance store volumes cannot be stopped. If the underlying host or hypervisor fails, you're going to lose your data. And EBS backed instances can be stopped, however, and you won't lose the data on this instance if it's stopped. And you can reboot both and not lose your data. And by default, both root volumes will be deleted on termination. However, with EBS volumes, you can actually tell AWS to keep the root device volume from being deleted. So you can um, you basically yeah, stop it from automatically being deleted. Uh, in terms of encrypting root device volumes. How do we do it? Well, we created a snapshot of the unencrypted root device volume. We then created a copy of the snapshot. And when we did that, we selected the encrypt option. We then created an AMI from the encrypted snapshot. And then we used that AMI to launch the new encrypted instances. So that's how we uh, basically encrypt our root device volumes using the AWS console. Don't forget, you can also do it using just software like BitLocker, etc, etc. 
So moving away from storage and moving on to networking with EC2. So we looked at three different types of networking. You started off with our ENI, our Elastic Network Interface. This comes with every EC2 instance. It's basically a virtual network card. Uh, you use this for basic networking. Uh, and perhaps you need to separate a management network from your production network or have a separate logging network and you need to do this at low cost. In this scenario, you'd go ahead and use multiple Elastic network interfaces for each network. We then looked at enhanced networking and uh, there was a couple of different options here. Um, but for when you need speeds between 10 gigabits per second and 100 gigabits per second, you're going to use enhanced networking. And this typically will be an enhanced network adapter or ENA. And it's used, like I said, for anywhere you, where you need high and reliable throughput. And then EFA is Elastic Fabric Adapter, and this is for when you need to accelerate high-performance computing and machine learning applications, or if you need to do an iOS bypass. So if you see a scenario questioning a question mentioning HPC or ML or an OS bypass and asking what network adapter you want to use, you're going to choose an Elastic Fabric Adapter. So you are going to probably get four or five different questions on networking and asking which uh, you know adapter sh you should use ENI for basic networking and enhanced network adapter or ENA if you need speeds between 10 gigabits per second to 100 gigabits per second and then if you're doing super high performance computing machine learning or you need an OS bypass go ahead and have a look at your elastic fabric adapter moving on to CloudWatch remember that CloudWatch is used for monitoring performance CloudWatch can monitor most of AWS as well as your applications that run on AWS CloudWatch with EC2 will monitor events every five minutes by default However, you can have one minute intervals by turning on detailed monitoring and you can create CloudWatch alarms, which then go ahead and trigger notifications. And CloudWatch is all about performance. CloudTrail is all about auditing. We're going to have another slide of that coming up. So what can you do with CloudWatch? Well, you can create dashboards, um, and this will allow you to see what's happening within your AWS environment all around the world. You can create alarms, and this allows you to set alarms that notify you when a particular threshold is uh, hit, like 80% or 90% CPU utilization. We can uh, monitor events. So CloudWatch events helps us to respond respond to state changes in our AWS resources. And you can also use logs, um, CloudWatch logs to help you aggregate, monitor and store your logging data. And like I said, CloudTrail versus CloudWatch. CloudWatch monitors performance. So think of someone at the gym, CloudTrail monitors API calls in the AWS platform. So CloudTrail will tell you who provisioned an EC2 instance or who set up an S3 bucket, et cetera, et cetera. We then learned about the command line. So you can interact with AWS from anywhere in the world using the CLI. You are going to need to set up access in IAM. This gives you an access key ID and secret access key. The commands themselves are not in the exams, but some basic commands will be useful to know for real life. We then looked at roles because we looked at um, on our EC2 instance, what happens if somebody goes into our secret directory, our .aws directory, which is in our home directory, and then opens up our configuration details, they'll be able to get our access key ID and secret access key. So roles are a much more secure way than storing your access key ID and secret access key uh, on individual EC2 instances. Roles are much easier to manage, and roles can be assigned to an EC2 instance after it's been created using both the console and the command line and roles are universal. You can use them in any region in the world. We then went on to bootstrap scripts. Bootstrap scripts run uh, when an EC2 instance first boots and can be a powerful way of automating software installs and updates. Um, so we've used it a little bit in this course so far. We're gonna use it a lot, uh, certainly in the next section. We're gonna create a, a bootstrap script that installs WordPress, and we're gonna use that to connect to our RDS instances. Um, so bootstrap scripts are incredibly useful as well. We then learned about instance metadata and uh, user data. So it's used to get information about an instance such as a public IP. And to do it, you just run a curl and then 169.254.169.254 forward slash latest forward slash metadata. If you want to get your user data, your user data is literally your bootstrap script that is passed um, to your EC2 instance when it first boots up. And again, you just run a curl 169.254.169.254 forward slash latest forward slash and then user data. Moving on 
on to EFS. That was the very last lab. So we uh, learned that it supports the uh, network file system version 4 or NFS v4 protocol. You only pay for the storage that you use. You don't need to pre-provision. So you don't need to go in and you know spin up an 8 gig instance or something like that. It basically grows as you put more files on it and can scale all the way up to petabytes. And it can, can support thousands of concurrent NFS connections. And remember, if you need shared storage, you can't share EBS with multiple EC2 instances, doesn't work like that, but you can create an NFS um, EFS mount uh, and then you can store your files in there and multiple EC2 instances will be able to access it. And with EFS, data is stored across multiple availability zones within a region. And in terms of the consistency model, you get read after write consistency. So in the exam, you're going to be given different scenarios and you're going to be asked to choose the best storage mechanism for the different scenarios. So EFS, you'd use it when you need distributed, highly resilient storage for Amazon Linux instances and Linux-based applications. Amazon FSx for Windows, you'd use when you need centralized storage for Windows-based applications such as SharePoint, Microsoft SQL Server, Workspaces, IIS Web Server, or any other native Microsoft application. And especially look for the term SMB. If it says you need SMB storage, then you're gonna want Amazon FSx for Windows. And then Amazon FSx for Lustre is when you're doing high speed, high capacity distributed storage. And this is gonna be for applications that do high performance compute, financial modeling, etc. And remember that FSx for Lustre can store data directly on S3. Moving on to EC2 placement groups. A placement group is simply how you place your EC2 instances. There's three different types of placement groups. The first one is a clustered placement group. We then have spread placement groups followed by partition placement groups. A clustered placement group is where you want low network latency, high network throughput. This will be where all your EC2 instances are in the same availability zone and as close together as possible um, so that you don't have any sort of latency. Spread placement group, these are for individual critical EC2 instances. So you want to make sure that they are, you know, basically in different availability zones and on different pieces of hardware. So if a rack does fail, it's only going to affect the one EC2 instance. It's not going to take two or three out at a time. And partitioned placement groups are effectively for multiple EC2 instances. So this will be for things like HDFS, HBase, and Cassandra clusters. Uh, and this is where you have multiple EC2 instances into a partition. And each partition is always going to be on separate hardware or separate racks uh, from the other partitions. So those are the three different types of placement groups. Just remember the clustered placement group doesn't uh, span multiple availability zones. Uh, whereas a spread placement and partitioned uh, placement group can span availability zones. Remember that the name that you specify for a placement group must be unique within your own AWS account. Only certain types of instances can be launched into placement groups. So these will be things like compute optimized, GPU, memory optimized, storage optimized, etc. And then also remember that AWS recommend homogenous instances um, within the clustered placement groups. So this is where you have the same uh, instance type. Uh, you can't merge placement groups and you can't move an, an existing instance into a placement group. What you can do though is create an AMI from your existing instance and then launch the new instance from the AMI into a placement group. And then just moving on to web application firewalls. In the exam, you're going to be given different scenarios and you'll be asked how to do things like block malicious IP addresses. Well, to do that, you need to use AWS WAF. You can also use network ACLs. And we're going to cover this in a lot more detail in the VPC section of the course. Uh, and you can also use WAF to do things like uh, block specific countries. You can look for query string parameters. You can also use WAF to block things like cross-site scripting and SQL injections as well. Well, congratulations. You've just finished up section four. This is definitely one of the more challenging sections of the course. I hope you had lots of fun. In the next section, we're going to go ahead and have a look at databases. So if you've got the time, please join me in the next section. Thank you.